My spouse and I are employed at the same marketing firm. Lucy holds the title of customer ambassador, though the specifics of her role remain elusive. I'm Mark, leading the IT team. Things were going smoothly. We were both employed and happy had just finished renovating our rundown house. We have two lovely children, Emma, 13, and Daniel, 11. We live near our families and have close friendships. Both over 30, we complement each other well, though she surpasses me in looks, standing at 1.75 meters with long blonde hair and captivating blue eyes. Lucy claims her family resides in Sweden, and she embodies a slim Scandinavian appearance. Energetic and vibrant, she never seems to stand still. I stand at 7.5 centimeters tall with sandy hair and prefer endurance sports like cycling and running, resulting in a slim, physically fit physique, albeit not overtly athletic. I was taken aback when invited to a long weekend on a private island owned by one of our firm's clients. Our CEO, Jack Edwards, explained that he, along with his wife Margaret, several directors and their partners would attend. Lucy was also invited due to her role as the client's main contact. It seemed I was there for number crunching, but hey, don't question a good opportunity. Jack emphasized the client's wealth and potential significance to our firm, mentioning an early Friday departure and Monday return on a private charter with all expenses covered. Lucy seemed well-informed, having worked closely with the client for months and eagerly anticipating the free weekend. Although I inquired about the plans, she didn't have much information, so I asked about the client. Lucy explained that his name was William Fellows, in his mid-forties, exuding confidence and inheriting a family fortune. She seemed somewhat fascinated, describing him as assertive and reserved. Great, I thought to myself, he sounds like an arrogant idiot but I decided to keep that observation to myself until the weekend. Two weeks later, on a Friday morning, we found ourselves aboard a private charter plane. I must admit I was impressed. If the island belonged to him, it must be quite luxurious. I wasn't sure what to expect, but it appeared vast, perhaps five miles long and a couple of miles wide. As we approached for landing, it resembled a five-star resort, with main buildings positioned behind a crescent-shaped white sandy beach. Lucy was thrilled, and the others shared her excitement. After settling into our rooms, we joined our host for lunch on the veranda overlooking the bay. Though I was initially wary, William seemed affable, and Lucy even downplayed his appearance, comparing him to George Clooney. He thanked us for coming and encouraged us to relax. We conversed with other couples from our firm and met a striking brunette named Charlotte, whom I assumed was William's companion for the weekend. Apart from the waitstaff, there was a man who appeared to be a security guard, lingering in the background. I wondered what threats William faced, requiring protection even on a secluded island. William greeted Lucy warmly, and they seemed at ease in each other's company. She, along with the others, appeared to heed his words, likely due to his generosity as a host and his importance as our firm's most valuable client. We had an excellent afternoon snorkeling, kayaking, and simply lounging around in the bay. Refreshments and food were readily available. Later, we all gathered for dinner with the group, enjoying a laid-back and amiable atmosphere as we engaged in conversations in small groups. Charlotte approached us, introducing herself warmly and sharing anecdotes about her upbringing in England. Despite giving the impression of coming from a well-off family, she seemed genuinely pleasant. I pondered whether she was a model or perhaps didn't have a need to work. To my surprise, she displayed flirtatious behavior toward me, even in Lucy's presence. I skillfully evaded her advances, attributing it to her overly friendly nature. With no childcare responsibilities in the serene setting, it was an ideal setup for a romantic evening. Lucy was especially affectionate, and our lovemaking was passionate. She professed her love for me repeatedly, making it one of the most memorable nights in a while. Perhaps there was merit to the notion of a love island after all. I hoped for a repeat the following morning, but Lucy promptly got ready for breakfast, prompting me to finally get out of bed and join her. As she conversed with Jack and William, I wondered if work matters were on their minds, given their slightly tense demeanor. Maybe William was exploiting the weekend to discuss work-related issues. Approaching them, the conversation appeared to falter briefly, and after a quick snack, we and the others continued to enjoy another delightful day by the pool. On Saturday, we ventured out for dinner, and I couldn't help but notice Lucy's enhanced attire. She looked stunning in a red satin evening dress and high heels, Following dinner, William requested a few minutes of our time. We agreed and followed him into the office, accompanied by a security guard. William took a seat in a plush leather chair while I settled onto the sofa opposite Lucy, observing her slight distance from me. After a prolonged pause, William mentioned that he had a proposition for Mark, stating it was of a personal nature. 
Mark responded affirmatively, maintaining composure despite feeling completely astonished. William elaborated, expressing his enjoyment of working with Lucy and the bond they had developed over the past few months. He hinted at a proposal, expressing his desire to spend the remainder of the weekend with Lucy. He offered compensation for her time away from me, proposing to transfer $100,000 into our joint account. I chuckled, assuming it was a jest, and couldn't resist making a quip about his generosity compared to a famous movie offer. However, the room fell silent, with no one joining in the laughter. William continued, Just like in any other business, I'm open to negotiating the price to get what I desire. Plus, Charlotte will be in a tough spot, and I'd appreciate it if you'd agree to entertain her. I glanced at Lucy, anticipating a smile, but instead she looked concerned. This isn't a joke, Mark, she said firmly. William invited me to join him, and I think we should seriously consider this offer. I felt the urge to lash out, but before I could react, the guard was already near. I was taken aback by how swiftly he moved. William pressed on, saying, I assure you, your wife fully supports this idea. What damage could come from it? We'll all have a great time, and you'll earn a substantial sum of money. Turning to Lucy, I remarked, Perhaps the difference in price is because Demi Moore didn't settle for that amount. Lucy winced at my comment, but wisely chose to remain silent. My mind raced as I struggled to think clearly, my breathing growing labored. I glanced at the guard, whose demeanor had shifted entirely. He appeared wary, focusing intently on my movements and with good reason, given my strong desire to strike William. What's your name? I asked, my voice strained. Ex-military, judging by your demeanor. You must deal with this sort of thing often. Shane, sir, he replied calmly. I can't comment on this matter, and if you were to attack your boss, I reckon I could handle you. Shane flashed a smile. Perhaps just to prevent you from doing so, sir. Turning back to William, I retorted, It's fortunate you brought him along, otherwise I might have knocked you senseless. William remained unfazed. Let's not rush, Mark. Much depends on this. Lucy interjected, urging me to consider. Think about it, Mark. Just a few days and money could change our lives forever. I was devastated. It was evident that Lucy was on board and even instigated this plan. Tell me, dear, I pressed. Did the offer of money sway you to agree to this? With no response from Lucy, I continued. I suspect Charlotte was offered as an added incentive. Who is she? A fancy woman? William responded. Charlotte is a close personal friend of mine. In addition to her wealth, she's an elite escort who only takes contracts that pique her interest. Rest assured, you'll have an extraordinary experience with her. Lucy winced again, but offered no defense. Well, William, I retorted, you can take your money and shove it up your perfumed rear end. At that moment, Lucy spoke up, revealing her true intentions. She explained to me that it was her decision, and emphasized that it was merely about physical lovemaking. She mentioned that both she and William were curious about exploring it with others, assuring me that their connection was limited to mutual liking and wouldn't diminish our love for each other. Lucy expressed confidence that both Charlotte and I would enjoy the experience. Stunned by her words, I gradually understood the gravity of the situation. I expressed to my dear wife that my desire for exclusivity was profound and meant more than she might realize. I accused her of betrayal and conspiracy behind my back, declaring that I could never trust her again if she was willing to engage in such behavior once. Lucy quickly responded, claiming that I was overreacting. She asserted that she had informed me about her intentions and insisted on her honesty. She mentioned that the affair would occur, but assured me of her return, promising full devotion afterward. Lucy appealed to my love for her, urging me to permit her this one indulgence. She pointed out potential benefits such as financial gain, vacations, and family experiences. Lucy warned against using our children as an excuse and rejected the idea that money motivated her, accusing me of harboring a desire for the affair. She concluded by suggesting that my honesty would only matter if we reached agreements together implying that I was aligned with William, whom she disparaged as an arrogant idiot. Lucy continued, stating that she believed the mention of money and Charlotte was only because she hadn't expected me to agree. She admitted that she still didn't agree, even with the offer of money. She confessed that she wanted to experience something different and was drawn to William, but she believed it shouldn't injury our relationship. I expressed my reluctance to change and questioned whether she believed this course of action was superior. I inquired if she had already made her decision, even going as far as dressing for the occasion. She warned me not to resist, indicating that I wouldn't appreciate the consequences. Confused, I asked for clarification on what she meant. She replied, 
suggesting that I wouldn't benefit from fighting against her wishes or seeking a divorce, as it would result in losing everything. She warned me that my home, children, and even my job would be endangered if I resisted, implying that accepting the situation would make everything easier. She mentioned seeing me the next day and assured me of her love and exclusivity. Feeling suffocated, I knew I had to leave before losing control. Struggling to breathe, I stood up and made my way to the door. Despite Lucy calling my name, I continued moving. In the hallway, Charlotte approached and embraced me, offering reassurance. I turned to her, acknowledging her presence. Who are you, a damn consolation prize? She walked away confidently. I continued walking and eventually reached outside, but I didn't feel well. I heard footsteps behind me and was disappointed to see it was Shane, not Lucy. Listen, Shane, you just need to leave me alone. I'd love to, but I need to ensure you don't do anything rash. Do you have any thoughts? Because I'm out of ideas. Mark, you don't look too good. Just sit against the wall, pull your knees up, and focus on taking long, slow breaths. Feeling weak, I lacked the strength to argue. It felt like an eternity, but it was probably only a few minutes before I calmed down. I noticed Shane sitting beside me. Thanks. I might have had an anxiety or panic attack. You looked pretty pale, but now you seem better. So, Shane, any ideas on how to get out of this mess? Shane replied, Honestly, you can't leave the island today. There are no boats, and the plane and pilot left for another charter. You could try radioing for help, but a cheating wife isn't exactly an emergency. I'm relieved you see her as unfaithful. She doesn't seem to grasp it, and I'm starting to doubt myself. What should I do? I can't even confront him now because of you. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I'd step aside, but it'd ruin my career. After a pause, Shane suggested, Think about your next move and come up with a plan. Whatever you decide can wait until Monday. It's like in the army. Strategize. Keep quiet about your intentions. The problem is I'm clueless about what to do. They seem to have everything figured out, and I'll just have to endure tomorrow and Monday while you babysit me. After a pause, Shane continued, There's a cargo ship arriving early Monday. You could hitch a ride if you want to avoid the plane. With everyone else leaving, they can't stop you. No one wants to be accused of kidnapping. I can even accompany you. This deal is losing its appeal. I don't like being on the wrong side, even if it's well-paying. Okay, that's helpful. I just need to get through tomorrow. How about we go hiking around the island tomorrow morning to distract you and think about Charlotte. She seems nice, and you've got nothing to lose. If you don't want to go back, you can crash in one of the booths tonight. No, I think our room is empty. I'll head back there. Maybe she'll change her mind. Of course she didn't. Surprisingly, I fell asleep, probably from exhaustion. The next morning, I changed into my workout clothes and hurried downstairs, hoping to avoid everyone and go on my hike with Shane. Unfortunately, the dining room fell silent as soon as I entered. I quickly grabbed some fruit and heard murmurs of reassurance that everything would be fine. Then, CFO John Cousins approached with his wife. Look, Mark, we've all been through this. Just go with it. It's not personal. He dallies with other wives, then moves on. And he's very generous. When he uttered those words, I noticed his wife's neck flush red. In that moment, Lucy and William emerged. She appeared utterly pleased with herself. Radiant, I'd say, until she caught sight of me. Her smile faded. She released that idiot's hand and approached me, intending to kiss or hug. I held her at arm's length and surveyed the room. God, I thought, what a damn idiot. Everyone knew what would happen before the weekend even started. What an absolute fool I was. I stepped out. Lucy implored, Please stay, Mark. Let's chat with the group and have another good day together. Scanning the room again, I found all eyes fixed on me, some anticipating, others amused by the scene. No, he paid for you and can keep you. But before I go, I need to address the group. I believe this weekend has been planned for some time, and you all have been in on it, so it's only fair that you hear me out. All members of the group exchanged shocked looks, nervously glancing at each other. Jack and Margaret, I wouldn't have come this weekend if it weren't for you. I never imagined you'd be involved in something so vile. You know and condone what he does, like some sick voyeur fan club. I hope you enjoyed keeping me in the dark. I noticed their awkward movements. This clearly wasn't part of their plan. I thought we were friends, and their efforts to make me feel at home so they could orchestrate everything was a nice touch. And Bill, you're wrong. This is deeply personal. So thanks for your role in wrecking my marriage. The fact that they're willing to leverage my children is frankly disgusting. I won't let anyone threaten my kids. Lucy interjected, You're overreacting. 
It was just closeness, a one-time adventure. I told you I love... I interrupted her, commenting on what I perceived as the initial phase of her defense strategy. I mentioned that I was aware she had planned my reaction, referring to her as Captain Ducker, and expressed curiosity about her intentions. I outlined Phase A as remaining in the current situation and being compelled to accept what had happened while trying to normalize everything. I mentioned the belief that I shouldn't overreact, be rude, or act childish, and acknowledged the need for personal growth, attributing any resistance to my ego. Despite knowing it wouldn't succeed, I described this as part of the process to soften my stance. Moving on to Phase B, I proposed that after the weekend I would take charge. I suggested increasing physical lovemaking, perhaps trying something new, and leveraging our connection to improve our relationship. I hinted that she may have discussed seducing me and affectionately urged her not to let my feelings of loss linger for too long. I described Lucy's nervous glance at William, indicating that my comment had affected her deeply. She mentioned the money he had offered and suggested using my earnings from prostitution to take the children to Disneyland, causing discomfort among some present. She outlined a potential phase B if our conflict persisted, referring to a seed planted the previous night, suggesting that allowing her desires was a test of my love. She acknowledged my 15 years of devotion and emphasized that this was just one night for me. She admitted that it might weaken her resolve but questioned what she would gain after 15 years of devotion if treated poorly. She expressed doubt about the effectiveness of the plan and suggested I give her time to cool down. She predicted that in about a week or two, I would likely be found drowning my sorrows at a bar, followed by her seeking forgiveness, which she referred to as Phase D. She questioned whether I truly regretted my actions and realized the depth of the hurt caused. She speculated that I wouldn't have pursued it if aware of the pain it would cause. She suggested I would profess love, beg, and cry, but expressed doubt about the effectiveness of this approach due to my public displays of affection with William. She concluded by stating that Phase D wouldn't work and hinted at the necessity of a backup plan. She referred to Phase D as threats, suggesting that she would take all the money, the house, and turn the children against me. She hinted at the possibility of losing my job and speculated about William providing top-notch lawyers for her. She described potential consequences of me ending up sad, broke, and alone, even suggesting the threat of moving in with him and living happily ever after with our kids. This last statement prompted a reaction from William, indicating his reluctance to such an idea. Lucy finally found her voice. It's not such a big problem, she began. Why don't we just relax and give ourselves time to think? This is phase A, Lucy. We've been through this, I said firmly. So, why don't we save everyone time and move on to the end result? That's what I pondered last night. And my conclusion is that everyone, including the kids, would be better off if we divorced. It's much healthier than living in an unhappy home. In the end, it was clear that neither of us could find happiness in the midst of this turmoil. I asserted that despite any attempts to prevent me from seeing my children, I knew I was a good father. And ultimately, that's what mattered. I expressed doubts about receiving support from her family and friends once they learned of her actions. Money was never my priority. It had always been about her. There was a moment of stunned silence among everyone present as I questioned if anyone had more tricks up their sleeves or if I had missed anything. When there was no response, I addressed Jack, stating that he could keep his job, but I would see him in court for wrongful termination, as my job depended on having my wife as a client, which seemed to be the underlying reason for the situation. With that, I left, and the room fell silent. Shane followed me as usual. As we exited, Shane chuckled. Well played. Looks like you took to heart the advice of keeping the plan to yourself. I couldn't help but smile. Yeah, seems I botched that idea. Shane actually laughed as we left the building. Good thing you stuck to civilian life. You'd never have cut it in the army anyway. Let's go. Shane grabbed his backpack and set off at a leisurely pace up the coast. After a mile, I struggled to keep up and began to wonder if it was a mistake. I heard him shout something from ahead about how physical exertion is a great way to distract from mental anguish. My burning muscles and lungs seemed to agree. The scenery was awe-inspiring and Shane proved to be excellent company. He transitioned from inquiring about me to sharing amusing anecdotes from his days in the British Army. We spent hours exploring the island's northern region, tracing the coastline and ascending to a central peak. When Shane proposed jogging downhill for our return, I struggled to keep pace, suspecting he slowed down either to assist or tease me, depending on one's perspective. 
By noon, we were back, and while I was gasping for breath, Shane, a former physical education instructor, assured me of my decent fitness level. Feeling drained, I made my way to my room, finding Lucy absent, which led me to wonder if she was earning extra money. After a refreshing shower, hunger drove me to the dining room in search of sustenance, only to be disappointed yet again by the presence of William and Lucy. Shane lingered in the background, looking remarkably fresh and dapper in a suit. William, in his usual confident manner, began to address me. Mark, my dear friend, I believe we started off on the wrong foot, and I want to extend my apologies. I have never encountered issues like this in my past relationships, and I certainly didn't intend to jeopardize your marriage. It's too late, I replied bluntly. You've completed the deed. I wish to retract my request to spend tonight with your wife and increase the compensation. With these words, William handed me a document. I opened it and found a check for $250,000. I glanced at Lucy, who seemed to be crying, and I couldn't resist commenting. You must have been quite skilled to earn that much, darling. Lucy's eyes sparked with anger. That's beside the point. We made a dreadful mistake and we're trying to fix it. William acted like a gentleman and genuinely cared about your reaction. I chuckled at this notion. What's your notion of an ideal gentleman? Did he express gratitude after lovemaking? There's no need for jesting, Mark. This was simply a misjudgment on our part. We misjudged your response. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience for both of us. You should appreciate Lucy's sacrifice to offer you and your children a better life. I questioned whether their actions were simply a misjudgment, expressing my clear opposition to their plan, which they disregarded. I pointed out that they could have stopped at any moment but chose to continue until satisfying themselves. I tore up the check, sparing them from disgrace, but emphasized that the betrayal remained, doubting it could be repaired this time. Lucy began crying as I addressed them, questioning their motives, whether it was about control or the thrill of pursuing another man's wife, and criticizing their behavior as pathetic. I highlighted William's age and compared his actions to that of a child taking toys just because he could, suggesting that he should be engaging in more meaningful pursuits. In response, William laughed, stating his oversight of an international corporation and his charitable donations. He criticized my management of the corporation and questioned my involvement in charity work, implying that I was too self-absorbed and preoccupied with manipulating lives to genuinely help others. He suggested that I derive pleasure from humiliating others, as evidenced by the way I planned the weekend. I informed Lucy that William's interest in her wasn't solely exclusive, as he was involved with every board member's wife, so she was just one among many. I then addressed William directly, urging him to mature and seek genuine relationships, suggesting that he use his wealth for good and change his unpleasant demeanor. This seemed to cause him to falter in his speech and appear uncertain for the first time. I then instructed Shane to remove the objectionable matter from my sight before I took action. I noticed Shane conceal a slight smile before addressing Felloez. I believe it's time for us to depart, sir, before your safety becomes a concern. After their departure, I grabbed a snack and headed to the beach, seeking to avoid the others. Just when I thought I was alone, I spotted Charlotte reclining in a hammock, engrossed in reading. If she was beautiful before, her smile now made her truly radiant. I approached her. Apologies for last night. Before I could say more, she responded, no need for apologies. I was certain you'd accept the offer. If I had known, I wouldn't have approached you. Your reaction is completely understandable, and your speech at breakfast was exceptional. I couldn't agree more. When you left, Lucy broke into tears, and I've never seen William appear so embarrassed. I relished every moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that, considering your circumstances. I replied, thank you. It's appreciated. I'm relieved things are becoming clearer. I'm tired of being told this is nonsense. You see, William is clueless about how to handle you. He's never faced rejection before and isn't accustomed to ethical dilemmas. Has he already offered you more money? Yes, just before I came down. A quarter of a million. What a fool. I advised him against it, but he's accustomed to paying his way until he gets what he desires. He'll face consequences for this, both professionally and personally. Charlotte was receptive and listened attentively as I discussed my marriage and children. Clearly intelligent and well-educated, she expressed surprise at Lucy's actions, given our seemingly content marriage, suggesting there might have been some discontent or an open arrangement between us. I pondered it. No, it's merely an unexpected betrayal. She seems entirely captivated by this man. He has a certain allure for women. It's charming, but the depth isn't substantial if you catch my drift. 
We conversed further and I felt somewhat relieved. You truly care for her. Your response to the proposals and at breakfast must be devastating. I shrugged. I regret my involvement in this. It's not your fault. I just need to endure one more night, then perhaps I can escape. She smiled again, becoming a pleasant distraction. Well, perhaps I can assist with this. Dinner surprised everyone when I joined. Lucy wasn't seated next to William anymore. Dinner proceeded normally, though I brushed off Lucy's attempts at conversation. When Lucy suggested going to bed early, I politely declined, citing other plans. She looked embarrassed, which heightened when Charlotte hugged me as I rose from the table. We left together, walking down to the cabins on the beach. Initially, the plan was just to depart together and give Lucy a taste of her own medicine. But holding Charlotte felt right, really right. And when we kissed, some of the disappointment from the past 24 hours faded away. I wrestled with maintaining my morals, my sense of right and wrong. Then I glanced at her. I suppose Lucy wanted me to be more adaptable. And as far as I'm concerned, Lucy has already broken our marriage vows. I had an exceptional night with Charlotte. It wasn't merely her physical beauty, she exuded a serene allure. Every gesture seemed calculated and flawlessly executed. She truly mastered her allure. Surprisingly, thoughts of Lucy didn't cross my mind, nor did I feel guilty. The painful image of Lucy with William erased any hint of remorse. I enjoyed myself. After a boat taxi to the airport and the usual flight home, I collected the kids and arranged their weekend as best I could. I fabricated a vague story about a disagreement between their mother and me, but suggested we have dinner together. As Lucy entered the house, hauling our heavy suitcase, the children dashed upstairs shouting, Hi, Mom! Lucy smiled. Dinner sounds good. Give me a few minutes to freshen up. I'd prefer if you didn't, Lucy. Like you said, I'm uncertain how much time I'll have with them. So I'd rather we go alone, Lucy. Upon meeting William, I felt an immediate connection. He exuded charm, confidence, and strength, reminiscent of old movie characters. It was odd that later, in Mark's presence, he seemed different. Flirting led to lunch, then dinner. It was exhilarating, dizzying even. After dinner, his goodnight kiss nearly melted me, but I was resolute not to cheat and informed him as such. William mentioned his past open relationships, making me wonder if Mark might be open to it. When he proposed the idea, I thought the money would justify it. Jack supported me, and we began planning for the weekend. The weekend started off wonderfully. I had a fantastic time with Mark and nearly abandoned the entire plan. If only I could. William assured me everything would be fine and advised Mark to relax. Both he and Jack anticipated Mark rejecting the idea, but suggested giving him time to calm down. Mark's reaction was completely unexpected and upended our plans. The most surprising thing was his apparent illness. Although I wanted to chase after him, William reassured me that everything would be okay. He arranged to meet Ed Charlotte, so when he didn't return, I assumed he stayed with her. I felt relieved. After waiting for months, I eagerly anticipated spending time with William. The moment he kissed me, I knew I would succeed. He led me to his bedroom, and even before I could undress, I was already filled with anticipation. William stood before me and undressed me delicately, treating me like a prized possession. I felt incredibly special. Despite his age, he was remarkably fit, and I wasn't disappointed by his physique or his masculinity. When I reached out to him, William pulled back and began kissing my entire body, exploring every inch. Gradually, he assessed my reactions and responded, seemingly understanding my desires perfectly. My first climax came quickly, thanks to his skillful touch. Upon regaining awareness, he rose and initiated a passionate kiss. His expertise in lovemaking left me in awe as waves of sensation enveloped my body. I was now completely consumed by desire as he intensified his rhythm. As the next climax approached, William kept pace with me. Eventually, we both found solace in each other's embrace. In the middle of the night, confusion engulfed me as I mistakenly believed I was with Mark, only to be startled by another man beside me. Feelings of guilt and concern for Mark's whereabouts flooded my mind. Evidently, I had disturbed William, prompting him to wake and reassure me with a kiss, alleviating my guilt. The following morning, as I attended to my morning routine, William approached me from behind, exuding insatiable desire. Returning to bed, 
we held hands before I took charge, straddling him, enraptured by the passion and ecstasy reflected in his expression. Once again, our passion culminated in a final climax, fulfilling my every expectation and leaving me elated. Thanking William for the wonderful night, it felt natural to intertwine our hands as we descended the stairs to the dining room, eagerly anticipating another night together. However, when I glanced at Mark, everything unraveled. Swallowing my panic, Mark's explosive outburst disrupted everything. It became evident that he hadn't slept with Charlotte. Despite my preparations for his departure, I was unprepared for his unexpected anger. His cold rage was unsettling as he systematically dismantled my arguments with logical precision. Despite William's support, Mark's swift rebuttal left me wavering. After his departure, I collapsed into tears, and for the first time, William appeared uncertain. Upon regaining consciousness, I attempted to locate him to no avail. Jack and William then suggested halting everything by offering more money. When we later presented Mark with this offer, I was astonished by the outcome. William's once commanding presence had dwindled so significantly that he appeared trivial. Previously, his authority was such that I unquestioningly accepted his every word, but now it was undermined to the extreme. Despite his assurance that we could enjoy ourselves without jeopardizing my marriage, this plan disintegrated, leaving me uncertain about everything. I then erupted into an irrational fury, assuming I would extend my stay on the island for enjoyment. However, Jack's calm yet cutting response caught me off guard. Don't be foolish, Lucy. If you want any chance of saving your marriage, seek forgiveness. Your words must be genuine and sincere. He doesn't seem inclined to change his mind. Personally, I couldn't disagree with anything he said during breakfast. I was even more startled when Jack informed William that things would never be the same again. He went on to affirm Mark's decency and argue that he didn't deserve any of the trouble we caused. William, he suggested, should heed his advice and mature. I was astounded to find Mark at the evening dinner. Despite my attempts to engage him in conversation, he simply ignored me. His departure with Charlotte left me devastated. Although I considered chasing after him, what could I say? After all, I had essentially encouraged him to leave and spent much of the trip rationalizing casual encounters. I felt enraged and betrayed, especially upon recollecting my own past actions with Mark. The fact that our actions were premeditated and widely known only intensified my feelings of guilt. I couldn't help but think I deserved it, perhaps hoping that mutual indiscretions could salvage our relationship. The flight back, sans Mark, made me realize the dire state of my marriage as he had found a way to leave the island ahead of us. I had never properly conversed with him. Following that incident, the gravity of my actions began to sink in, and waves of guilt overwhelmed me. I rationalized about the money. Who would turn down such an offer? My tears became uncontrollable sobs verging on hysteria. Jack and Margaret grew increasingly worried about my well-being, Upon returning home, Mark was present but declined to have dinner with me and the kids. I nearly held it together until they departed. Then I broke down in tears once more. Being excluded from the meal felt like an ominous foreshadowing of my future. When I regained composure, I struggled to anticipate what to say when Mark returned. The dilemma was that everything I thought of echoed what he had already expressed, and I felt embarrassed to seek advice from my mother or friends. Upon arriving home, the kids retreated to their rooms, engrossed in their usual video games and phones. I observed Lucy in the kitchen, feeling a sense of unfamiliarity. She approached me, almost whispering, Can we talk? I mean, really talk? I shrugged, thinking that we should address this eventually, so why prolong it? I'm sorry, Mark. I assure you it was just a one-time thing and I'll be yours again, faithful as before. The weekend. I did it for the money. It could change our lives as a family. I did it for us. You did it for yourself. We were fine. Money wasn't an issue. You couldn't wait to jump into his bed. You must have enjoyed the fancy dinner and closeness. Overall, everyone had a good time. You're overreacting. It shouldn't mean anything. You really should skip the excuses, Lucy. It's nonsense, and you know it. This wasn't casual. It was a premeditated betrayal. Arrogant, selfish, all those traits I detest, and now I loathe you. So you did the same to that woman. No, I didn't. I sought revenge because nothing seemed to penetrate your indifference. 
You couldn't see how it affected me. I wouldn't have even considered it if I had a faithful wife. And I hope it stings, really stings, so you might understand my pain. Only I didn't scheme this in advance, making myself look like a fool to everyone else. Speaking of which, how long did your secret scheme take, and was this your first time with him? Her eyes widened. Then she seemed to grasp that this was a genuine and reasonable inquiry. It marked our inaugural dinner, and I sensed his interest in me. Jack and Margaret seemed to be probing, subtly asking if I was intrigued. The four of us dined together, and for the first time in my marriage, I felt a stir of attraction toward another man. His self-assurance was captivating. Knowing it was wrong, I resisted vehemently, avoiding an affair. Then William floated the idea of broaching the subject of opening up our relationship with you and gauging your thoughts on change. We briefly discussed it one evening, but it was evident you wouldn't consent. Then he proposed this plan, thinking the money would sway you. As the trip neared, nerves set in, and he suggested inviting Charlotte to ensure your agreement. Though I wasn't keen on the idea by then, I simply wanted it to unfold. I thought even if you didn't wholly endorse it, we could bounce back. But at breakfast, you shattered these notions, and I began to grasp the consequences of my actions. Was it worth it? Lucy sighed. No, definitely not. I got swept up in the moment and heeded his words. I never intended to hurt you. Oh, so, unintentional pain. Straight to phase D. You seem to be enjoying this. Your energy during breakfast said it all. Now you're just telling me what I want to hear. Sorry, the honest answer is yes, I enjoyed it. He was good. It wasn't about being bigger or better, just different. It was exhilarating, a new thrill, and I was captivated by it. He's very experienced and skilled, but it was a one-time thing. Please don't abandon us and break up our family over a single mistake. I found myself smiling wryly. Funny, that's exactly how I'd describe what you've already done. Shattered our family over a one-time act. It's all on you. You're right. It's all my fault. I'm deeply sorry. I love you with all my heart. Well, not entirely. Part of it went to him. And even if you claim otherwise, your love wasn't enough to keep me faithful. How can I trust you again? I was so trusting because I never imagined you capable of this. I feel like I don't really know you. I can hardly bear to look at you, let alone pretend. This never happened. Lucy recoiled in shock. You can't claim to love me. I know. I never imagined losing you. I agree. You only considered yourself and your desires neglecting me and the kids. But sometimes, love isn't enough. I stated that I tried to calm down and steer away from scoring points or escalating the argument. After a long pause, I continued addressing Lucy. I mentioned that even if we decided to stay together and ignore the issue, things would never be the same. I emphasized that she had shattered the trust and sense of care we once had for each other, adding that she knew this more than anything. I reminded her that we cared about each other and the kids and didn't want anyone else to get hurt. I expressed my disbelief that she could hurt me like this. She expressed her love for me, and admitted to making a colossal mistake, stating her willingness to do anything to rectify it. However, she disagreed with the idea of getting divorced just to appease me, mentioning that I broke her heart and threatened her, actions she believed were not indicative of true love. Lucy stared in silence, stunned, unsure of what else to say. We need to discuss the children, I believe kids are better off in separated families than in dysfunctional ones. So, from that perspective, divorce seems like the best option. I agree you should have custody, but don't try to prevent me from seeing them. It's for your benefit, too. They listen to me. You're not very good at setting boundaries. I furrowed my brow at the irony of her statement. And they're already testing you. It's better for you and for them if I remain in their lives. Lucy shrugged. Seriously, Lucy, regardless of what happens, don't keep the kids from me. Don't alienate me. I'm not a bad father. I treat them well and love them dearly. You haven't seen me angry yet. I'll fight you tooth and nail. Spend all our money on lawyers and we'll tear each other apart in the process. She nodded. I'd never do that. You're a wonderful father and they need you. They'll want you to keep taking them on trips and coaching them in all their sports. I turned to her surprised by the first comment where I felt she wasn't trying to manipulate me or justify her actions. Be careful, Lucy. You're seriously pushing phase D. Even though you know who I am, why do this? I can't help but think you secretly wanted us to split up. Lucy urgently expressed, God, never. There's no excuse for this. I became selfish, convinced I could gain something more. It felt like I could somehow hold on to you. Why didn't you stop me that night and just leave? 
Reflecting on the situation, I mentioned finding it hard to breathe and needing to leave. After that, nothing seemed to matter much anymore. The fact that she pursued another guy at any cost meant I had already lost her. I suggested that the conversation ended us long before she ended up in his bed. Perhaps it was all over when she first started planning everything. She spent weeks talking to him and getting ready. Letting her go and not trying to stop her made it easier to accept the end. I emphasized that there was no turning back. That was the beginning of the end. The marriage crumbled in less than four days. We divorced, thankfully, without needing counseling. I think Lucy didn't want to justify her actions. It's a shame in a way. I hoped a professional could help her see how wrong she was. She did keep one promise, though. And in the end, we split time with the kids about equally. She even confessed to them that everything was her fault, without getting into specifics. They were old enough to understand, and often chose for themselves where to stay. They were at that age when parents became famous, as taxi drivers and loan sharks. I might be biased, but I think they're great kids and handled the breakup remarkably well. Children can be surprisingly resilient. As per the divorce terms, Lucy could keep our house until the kids came of age, then sell or buy it. But I still wanted it for the children. It allowed them to stay in the same school. Luckily, it paid off. By the time the kids went to college, real estate prices had soared. Lucy had to buy out my share, and it turned out to be the best investment of my life. How could she afford it? Well... We split $250,000 in the divorce. Like with Charlotte, I couldn't claim the moral high ground. What can I say? I'm a practical person. Either way, it seemed like a small price compared to the cost of the marriage and our once happy life. I left my job, received a payout to avoid the embarrassment of a tribunal, and started my own web design business. Lucy kept trying to reconcile, but I wasn't interested. So, was ending the relationship the right choice? It was messy, and there were no winners but the dire threats and consequences never materialized. I wasn't going to forget or forgive that night.